Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You're here because like me, you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that are gonna help you actually execute on your dreams. Today's guest is a musical legend who's been shaping the world of music for more than 20 years. He sold roughly 9 million albums as a solo artist, 22 million albums as the founder and guiding member of the seminal group, the Fugees, and collectively over 100 million records when you tally everything he's produced for himself and others. He has worked with a ridiculous list of artists, including Avicii, T.I., Michael Jackson, Shakira, Whitney Houston, Santana, Destiny's Child, and Tom Jones, to seriously name just a few. Along the way, he's racked up three Grammy Awards, seen the Fuji's album The Score certified six times platinum, and ended up on the cover of Rolling Stone's Top 50 Hip Hop Players Edition. And to top it all off, his song Hips Don't Lie, which he wrote for Shakira, is the most played song of all time. But what makes him really fascinating to me is that his impact has been felt well beyond the world of music. Not only has he been a guiding light to millions of immigrants and aspiring artists, but he's put himself on the front line of aid work in Haiti by creating a foundation designed to empower Haitians. To really understand the ground level, gritty ass impact that he and his team have had, you must, must read his jaw dropping autobiography, Purpose, An Immigrant Story. It is fucking crazy. All right, having returned now his sights back to music, he is hard at work crafting his latest solo project out this summer titled Carnival 3, Road to Clefication. Please help me in welcoming the immigrant son of a preacher who once ran for president of Haiti, the incomparable Wyclef John. Thank you. Superman lives, man. Yeah. Superman lives in you, my friend. Superman lives, man. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, man. And really, it's one of those things, and I'm sure you get this as an artist, there's sometimes a, a feeling that you have that's really, really hard to put in words. Mm -hmm. And the gratitude that this entire team has when Christopher announced that you were coming on, we started blasting the, oh. the Fuji. Oh, wow. And gone until November, and like uh, the whole house was just like, all right. Bumping, everybody was really excited. In the crib, crunk. Exactly. Got you, man. Exactly. Yeah. The thing that resonates with us, and I think the thing that will really resonate with our audience, is the basement years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming here at nine, sort of on the cusp of 10 from Haiti, yeah. having lived without your parents who had come to America almost 10 years before you, right? Yeah. Um, that had to just be brutally difficult. And what you've turned out of that is, is incredible. What was that like, um, being an immigrant and then trying to make a name for yourself? Well, I mean, I was born in Haiti in a small um, village. Um, and the, imagine a place, so no electricity. Uh, no running water, mm -hmm. and similar to the movie um, Slug, Slumdog Millionaire, um, we have what's called a ravine, mm -hmm. a ravine, that's where you use the bathroom. So um, one uniform for the whole year, you feel me? Wow. One pair of shoes, at times you take a donkey to school. For me, it's, it was a, a culture shock, right? Because you go from that and then uh, the next thing you know, you land in the middle of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, it was the it was just a different reality because my parents left me at a young age when I was one. I was raised mm -hmm. with my aunt. So they come and get you like nine years going on, 10 years later. And, um, and me and my brother's at an airport for the first time in our life. So can you imagine that what that plane looks like to us? Because from the village, when we used to see that plane so high in the air, we used to think that it was giant birds. Yeah, one of my favorite stories from your autobiography is when you were saying that, so your aunt would say, hey, these presents are from your mom and dad in America, and yeah. you didn't believe that right. you actually had a mom and dad. Yeah. It was easier for you to believe that your parents were Santa Claus yeah. than that you actually had parents in America. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because when you're in the village and they're like, okay, this bicycle was sent to you by your mama in America, in your brain, you thinking... Um, imaginary friend. Mm. You're like, yeah, 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 my mom in America. It's almost like you're thinking like they're saying this because in your reality, in your brain, if you had a mom, 
there's no way that your mom would have you basically in this village, mm. um, you know, growing up like this. So, um, so you're thinking maybe your aunt or maybe your mom, who's your aunt, basically got you this gift and trying to make you feel good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that really gave me a sense of, you know, how um, different it must have been. And because you don't have an accent, I think it's easy for people to forget that you spent a long time before you came to America. Yeah, you know, I, I do have an accent. But the problem is I don't put the accent on, you know. But when I first come to America, I can't speak English. This is the accent. This is how the Asian talk, you know. We come and this is just how we talk, you know. We don't know how to speak English. The way, you know, I learn how to speak English is... You know, when I'm in the projects, I sit in the projects, one day I hear outside, and I hear this thing go boom, 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 you know, and then you're trying to, so I'm trying to hear the words. And then, you know, the words are like, the hip, the hop, the hippie, the hippie, the hippie, hippie, pop, you don't stop, the records, the hop, 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 and literally, you start to learn English through the slang that you're hearing coming out of the music of the mm. streets or walking around, you know what I mean? And, um, and then eventually, like, as the years get older, it's not that you don't have an accent, but it, there's a way where you can pull it out or pull it back in because you've lived here so long. Most kids, I would say, if you're north of seven or eight when yeah. you come, you're almost certainly gonna have an accent. So yeah. when I heard how old you are, I was really, really surprised. In the beginning, did you feel like you were putting on an American accent? Yes. Because I used to watch television, like my dad in the hood in America was in the projects. He had one television with an antenna in it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, the antenna was a clothes hanger. You feel me? We was only allowed to watch at times cowboy movies and uh, uh, Sesame Street. So the, the, the TV stayed on PBS and every show we learned. So um, I learned like watching like the Muppet Show. Hey, my name is Kermit. <laughs> so I learned how to do the Kermit voice and talk like Kermit. So automatically you're learning this, you're watching this, and subconsciously, like you're picking up the language. It's really interesting. One of the notes that I took about you as I was doing the research is you have an uncanny ability to do impressions. Do you think that's tied to your musicality? Like, it's very interesting and very unique. So I was always like the kid that no matter how bad the day is, I'm gonna make everybody feel good. Um, I, I just love the uh, characters playing them back for my friends and making them laugh. It was sort of like when I came around, it was a way of making everyone forgot where they were at and that they were in a good place, subconsciously, you know? It's interesting, because watching that play out, one of the things that I would say is your hallmark is you're so eclectic, right? So your sound is global. Uh, it's impossible to put you in a box. You listen to an album, you're gonna go everywhere sonically, um, which clearly is, uh, you had said, you know, after um, the score sold 22 million albums, you were actually tense because now you were a pop star and you wanted to get to something really, really artistic again. Um, and did the carnival was the next yeah. album you did, right? Yeah. So, one, walk us through that mentality of the of bringing all these disparate things together, which you seem like you watch a lot and then assimilate all the different useful pieces. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so the the musicality aspect of it, it's it all starts in that small village, you know. Mm. So you wake up every day, um, you can hear. So the rooster wake you up. And the rooster has a note, you know mm. what I mean? Then you go outside, the wind has another note, and lightning and thunder has another note. So you adapt to nature. So then by the time I got to the States, I always say like the orchestra lived in my brain. So my daddy started a church in the hood. So basically in the apartment where he started the church, um, I was one Christmas, he bought us um, a bunch of instruments. My dad did not want us listening to rap music because he felt that his exact words was it was drug dealer music and I didn't want y'all to get involved in it. Um, he did not want us listening to pop music. So anything that was on radio, we could not listen to um. it. The station we could have listened to was called Family Radio. So Family Very Radio sexy. was playing, everything had to be God and church related. So then, we fell in love with a band called Petra because Petra yeah. was a Christian rock, rock band. Yeah, for sure. And if Petra's watching this, 
it's too late for Annie. Like they're like, holy crap, I left <laughs> my music. So, so Petra started this whole eclectic thing. Being that we couldn't listen to nothing, Petra was the closest thing to the police synchronicity mm. that we was gonna get at the time because we didn't know who the police was. So in the church, we was like, yo, so if, if daddy let us listen to this, maybe we could start off with a Christian rock sound. And we was like, okay, now that we start off with a Christian rock sound, I said, I got an idea. Nobody in this church speak English anyway. So what we'll do is we're going to learn all of the pop songs that daddy don't want us to listen to. We're going to learn Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, the police. And then they don't speak English. All they know is a few English words. So every English words they know, it's for them. We'll put them in the song. <laughs> so we put Jesus, hallelujah, devil's a liar, and one other one. <laughs> so, the thing is like, so, that, so it's like, so it don't matter where you're going. The rule that I came up with is every eight bars, just make sure one of them key words is in there. So right. we'd be like, uh, so you say I got an ugly face, man, I got no worries. Hallelujah <laughs> for Jesus, you know. Um, we had another one. Like, <laughs> all night long, all night, all night. For Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, so we was thinking. That's so, awesome. So we came up with this format where now from this, my brother, his uh, name is Samuel, the second one, he started getting hold of these cassettes and he started bringing them. And he was like, yo, this is, it was a white tape with, with black markings on it. It was a cassette. And I was like, what's this? He said, yo, this is the police synchronicity. He said, they better than Petra, but don't let dad listen to this. So my first CD was like Police Synchronicity, then he bought me Pink Floyd. Mm. So while all of this is going on, um, I was taping, sneaking and taping stuff off of Kiss FM, DJ Red Alert, and making these tapes. And then at night, I would be listening to the rappers. So while all of this is going on outside on the block, because you're going to leave the house now, you're going to walk down the street. Right. Marlboro Projects was the most craziest project at the time. Bodies on the roof. Every month there's a body Jesus. on the roof. So you're automatically going to be part of a gang. So my man Jeffrey used to be on the street and I used to see him battle rapping. And I just was like, yo, what's that? Because it looked like two guys literally was about to fight. Mm. I was like, yo, bye, bye, bye. And he was like, nah, it's called battle rapping. So I fell in love with the idea of like, wow, war of words. So then, um, being that I couldn't speak English, I could memorize things. So I started memorizing everybody's battle raps. Like oh. I would listen to like Coogee rap. Because they're I being would, recorded? No, because they had on the radio, they would be playing Coogee I rap. See, so I would it, record it. all this. Then in a battle rap competition, I would show up. And then I would be, it was like, what is the English word called? Plagiarism? Plagiarism. When you take someone else's. So I basically was doing Coogee rap. And everyone was like, yo, this, this kid's a spitter, yo. Like, oh, man, he that young and that mean. Um, and I got away with it for like two months till, <laughs> till of course, you know, there was another kid who <laughs> obviously he was listening to the same stuff as me. <laughs> yeah, he was like, yo, man, you biting, man. And I'm like, uh, what's that? Biting. You... You biting, man. You bit somebody else's lyrics. That was my first time understanding. Oh, that means biting means you're taking up somebody else. And he's like, yo, that's Coogee rap, man. Get out of here, man. You a fraud, man. So now I'm kicked out of the cypher, you know? And now, now I go back in my house. I'm devastated at this point. You know, and then I take up my little pencil and then I start to write. My name is Nelly Nell and the place to be. I'm rocking on the mic so viciously, you know, he starts like, <laughs> and so this started this, this, this obsession with just words and constantly mm. wanting to write words. And then I would put the pen down and just start to memorize. And while all this is going on, my mom's in the house on Sunday and it's like, you know, the devil went down to Georgia to find his soul to steal. And she's listening song. to Charlie Daniels. 
you know? And so all I couldn't even, it was so much different kind of music. Mm. Um, by the time I got to high school now, I was playing like seven or eight instruments. Wow. And um, and then I was all sitting- All self-taught? Yeah, all, all just, like I could just hear it in my brain. Wow. You know what I mean? Um, and I tell people, this is a, a funny story. I said, if you want to know how deep I am in the culture, the first person who did my demo was Curtis Blow. Wow. I was like 15. And then I said, the first music video I ever appeared on, I was an extra for Eric B and Rakim. I love that. Don't sweat the technique. <laughs> so when I show up at music videos, I spend one hour talking to the extras mm. about how important That's cool, your man. role is. Because I was like, yo, if y'all go back in Rakim, Rakim ain't even know who I was. But I was such a good extra. I think I got more shots than Rakim. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so you got all of this stuff going on in high school. I got introduced to jazz. Mm. And I felt deep into jazz and became like a jazz major. And I would say the jazz shape my brain up in the form of an orchestra. Now I was learning the discipline of the music. And mm. when people was listening to Michael Jackson, I was like, who's Quincy Jones? Wanted to be like Q. So by the time I'm 17, I just have so much music in my brain where it's not categorized. Like I didn't understand this has to be hip hop, this has to be country, this has to be rock. I didn't know what that mean. Right. It's sort of like I, I, I grew up like my daughter's growing up right now at 11, where she can go from Jay-Z to Coldplay, Coldplay to Dylan, Dylan to Errol Fitzgerald, and it all seems normal for her, you know? Yeah, that, it's really fascinating. One thing I don't want people to lose sight of is that during this time as you're collecting all this eclectic music, as you've got all these instruments in your hands and you're you know, beginning to, to dabble around, that you're really going hard and you're learning theory. And you once said to, um, to all the young producers out there, you don't need to want to play an instrument, but you need to learn the theory. Yeah, the theory is important. I would say I spent a little time with Michael Jackson, right? So, so let me take you into Michael Jackson, right? So. <laughs> This is this shit is really cool. Like this is so I get a phone call and the phone go off. And as you can see right now, you could tell I'm a prankster, right? I like to punk my friends. I'm the original Ashton Kutcher, right? So <laughs> so so my phone goes off and I pick it up. So keep in mind it's them old school big drug dealer phones. You know what I mean? Them them, them El Chapo phones, you know? Like, yo, what's up, man? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, yo, it's like um. Hi, can I speak to Wyclef? Like, yeah, this Wyclef. This Michael Jackson. Man, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, dude, I hung up on Michael Jackson, man. This is not good. <laughs> so the phone goes off again, man. And bang. Hello? Yo, yo, who stop playing? And as he starts to talk, holy shit. Michael Jackson, real Michael Jackson. How do you convince you he was Michael Jackson? Cause it's that thing, right? Because reality is gonna strike you mm. by what he starts to say. Because he's like, yo, I'm sitting here in Asia and I'm looking at this TV and I'm seeing this song and out of nowhere the airport and the violins come out, Bob Dylan's on the side. Wow, okay. And I'm like, as he starts to talk, I'm freaking mm. out. And he's like, yo, this gone to November thing. And, um, and he's like, yo, I'm coming to New York. Um, we got to rock a session, you know wow. what I mean? And it was the most incredible, one of the most incredible sessions because Michael Jackson was sitting there, right? And literally as he's moving his body, it's theory. The, the entire orchestra was in his head, you know? Now, I encourage kids to do the same. I need you to know what Dorian means, Ionian. Phrygian, Mixolydian. This, right now, they're going to look it up, and they, when they see me, they're going to be like, Uncle Clef, I know what Dorian is. Um, I really need you to study this. Now, why is this important? This is mm. very important because music is so vast. I don't just want y'all to just do records that's going to last 30 seconds and y'all disappear because that's what happens, right? Quincy Jones gave me a lot of information. Stevie Wonder gave me a lot of information. So when I'm in the studio with Young Thug, my job is to give him the information. 
It's so important that I pass that information. If I'm doing this, uh, if I'm rocking with Lil Wayne, I gotta give him that information. Acorn. Is the information about the music, the theory of music, longevity in general in the industry? The, the information is to understand your position within the industry and how it's vast. You can be doing tracks for other people, tracks for yourself, tracks for movies, scoring films. Mm. Like, don't limit yourself to the possibilities of one thing. These kids got to make a living. They make a living on what's working for the time, right? Yeah, sure. That's how they moving. But at the same time, I tell kids that every day the technology changes, every day the music changes. So if you want to be in contemporary music, you have to know what is the modern software. So... When I was in the studio with Avicii, for example, now it's years later. I never leave home without my guitars, right? I've always got a guitar with me, you know? And my mama changed this because I used to have a gun. You feel me? Because mm. I used to watch some cowboy movies. You know what I'm <laughs> saying to you? So my mama was like, you know, like, if you could have a guitar, it'd be much better. You'll get more accomplished, right? So she- Good she, tip. Yeah, good tip, right? So, so now I always have a guitar with me. Can you believe now I show up in the studio with Avicii? I play live and then I mix it. Avicii shows up with a computer. Whoa, this is deep. Now it's gonna be the clash of the worlds. This is information now. Now, we're doing a record, and Avicii goes, man, I'm hearing a voicing. I'm hearing a Ray Charles voicing. Wait, wait, he's on a computer, and he's telling me he's in. For those who don't know what that means by he's hearing a voicing, so if you, so this is like a voicing, right? So you can say, one, two, three, right? One, two, five. So together, you have, yeah, do that. Yeah. Right? I did not expect to be singing today. Yeah, no, no, check that out, right? So that's one, three, five. So that basically means, right? Do, right? Do is one, right? So we have do, that's one. Re, two, three, mi, fa, sol. So he was saying one, three, five. And I was like, she so said, I'm hearing a Ray Charles voicing. I know no Ray Charles voicing is 135, because 135 is, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. You know, that, that's country music. Right. So he said, I'm not expecting this dude to say Ray Charles voicing. Now we're getting into it. Because that's like, you know, 137, what, it gets, and he goes on the computer. He pulls up the Ray Charles piano, and he starts to break down the theory now through the software. Wow. And he plays the Ray Charles thing and he goes, this is how I'm hearing it. So once again, he's doing the theory, but it becomes modern. So if a kid is just sitting in the school and you're just learning that and you're not understanding that the theory is constantly changing every day, then you're gonna be stuck. So this is once again, I commend kids and tell them, learn the entire game, mm. you know, which is very important. As much as I love the Fuji's, as much as I love what I did, one of my favorite things was when I got a call from Brian Grazier to score the movie Life for Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence. Then I was able to use the side of my brain from high school. These are going to be violins. You're going to bring the emotion. So once again, it's a 360 thing that I want the kids to understand. Um, I remember I got a call that was like, Hotel Rwanda, we need you to do the theme song. I did the theme song for Hotel Rwanda. I got nominated for a Golden Globe. Mm. I was so excited. I showed up at the Golden Globe with my tux. I was like, yo, <laughs> I'm about to get this Golden Globe. And, um, and Mick Jagger beat me. And, um, and I was like, yo, if anybody's going to beat me, <laughs> it has to be Mick Jagger. You know what I'm saying to you? But once again, that's what I want kids to understand. Like, yo, don't limit your imagination. Mm. Like, really push it, push it, push it as far as you can, you know? Yeah. Now I want to recontextualize you because what I want people to, to see, because this is such a powerful story. You're uh, an immigrant to the country. By this point, you're, you know, barely speaking English. You're trying to fit in. You'd said at one point, I was going to learn American music better than the Americans so that I could get acceptance and fit in. Yeah. 
but you really push it hard and become truly a student of the game, like really drinking it in. And it's, you know, the quote from Malcolm X, knowledge is power, right? And once you, once people really understand what that means and that that applies to no matter what you want to do. Yeah. In fact, the first piece of business advice I ever got from my father-in-law, which I totally ignored, he said, no more about a meeting, whatever that you're going into than anyone else. And I have since echoed that with the concept of whatever you want to do, whatever your passion is, to know if it's your passion, you need to be able to answer yes to the following question. Do you want to know more about it than anyone else in the world? Like once you're prepared to go down the rabbit hole like that, once you're prepared to really 360 degree like you're talking about and get that world of knowledge in your brain. In fact, this is how I interview. So I get asked all the time how I interview. And what I'm trying to do, man, I'm... So take you, for instance, I'm reading your autobiography and you'll mention where you grew up. Okay, well, I don't just go past that. I've never seen it before. So now I'm going to Google Earth. I zoom in. I look at the blue tarp roofs in the areas, you know, that are the hardcore slums, and I really get a sense of where you grew up. Okay, so now I come back out. You mentioned a song. I actually haven't heard that song, so now I'm going to go play that song, right? So that by the time you and I sit down, like, I know your universe. I know the impressions that you can do. I know what your dad sounds like. I know about the rap battling, and, you know, so that... Now it's like wherever you want to go, right? So I'm in this umwelt that is you. Wherever you want to go, I'm right there with you. I know where you're trying to go because I understand that now we can take it somewhere useful because I can go in any direction. I know the theory. So anybody who's watching this, and there's so many people that they want to be successful at whatever. A lot of them, I'm sure, want to be successful in music, but that's certainly not the only thing. What are the secrets to getting great? When I bring an artist to the studio, whether if it's Shakira, who I, I have a real simple question, whether if it's Whitney Houston, just tell me what you want. If you want a hit song, just tell me. Because a lot of people ain't honest with themselves about what they really want. So anything you want, you can get, but you, you have to be honest about it. And this is really what I encourage people to do. In order to be successful at anything, it has to be what you truly love. Because if you don't love it and you ain't willing to die for it, don't do it, right? Sometimes you have to do these transitional jobs to get to where you have to go to. But it's okay. If you got to sell bed sheets, sell these bed sheets. Do what you have to do. Do it with pride. But at the same time, do not let any job that you do kill your dream. Mm. Because the only thing that can make you feel alive is your dream. Very important. I love how hard you've worked for your dream. That's one of the things that I found so amazing. We were talking before the camera started rolling that friends used to call you a tech nerd. I believe yeah, yeah. it was the term they used. And they got that because you were able to break apart. So you couldn't afford sort of the mainstream equipment, right? But you didn't let that stop you. Mm -hmm. uh, you had one quote where you said, um, we created the score in my uncle's basement. We couldn't afford the best equipment, but nothing could limit our souls and imagination. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh my God, like that's, that's the vision that I have of that album then going on to be as exceptional as it is. You called it a, a, a damp, smoke-filled basement you know, where I can just see like this dingy basement and the three of you like knowing what you want to bring to the world, right? Knowing yeah. what that piece is that you want to create and not letting anything stop you to the point where you are breaking the equipment apart, rebuilding it, right? Most people, they stop it, I can't afford it, right? Think about that. They stop it, I can't afford it. They don't become you because they're not putting in the work, right? They're not putting in the work to say, this is a machine that I can afford. I'm going to disassemble it, learn it, figure it out, listen sonically. You talked a lot about that, knowing that, okay, this thing that I can afford makes a similar tone. If I do this, I can put it back through a MIDI and really create this yes. sonic landscape. Yeah. Man, I mean, one thing no one could take from us is our mind, right? So basically, if you have a piece of equipment that you want to buy that's $25,000, mm. you can't afford that. But you have the brain. And this thing makes sound you automatically, in your mind, you has to go, well, that's just vibration. <laughs> He's making me pay $25,000 for a piece of vibration. So what happens is, inside of the studio, you cannot afford a Fender Rhodes because a Fender Rhodes was too expensive. Okay, cool. But then, when I go to Sam Ash, they can't kick me out for reading the manual. 
Oh my God, that's so smart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So See, you can't kick me out for reading the manual. So by the time you figured out I don't want to buy nothing, I done computed all this information in my brain. That's so smart. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so there was a piece of equipment called an Akai S900. And it's just a tone. It's an oscillator. What is an oscillator? It sounds like this. Wow, oscillator. So that means that I can trick the human mind because if the tone is already going to and I shorten the frequency, I could go once I MIDI the oscillator back, now I could cheat by using the MIDI. Mm. And then the oscillator is just going to register a vibration to the human. Because the human being don't know what the hell a Fender Rhodes is. They don't know what that is. All they know is they can relate to a vibration. Mm. And as long as I could bring them that vibration, that's when I know I got them. So for every part of the score where we couldn't have feed that afford that piece of equipment, I just recreated the vibration. It's amazing. So take us back to the, the basement. Your first album is people aren't ready for it, right? It doesn't hit. How do you guys have the courage to put out the second album to dare so, I mean, to, you created one of the most memorable albums of all time. Like, how do you have the foresight to pull that off coming off of what was a commercial failure? So a product manager gets us in with this gentleman by the name of Salam Remy. This is an important name because if you're watching the Amy Winehouse documentary, mm. Amy calls up Salam Remy and she's like, Salam, I got these ideas in my head. And she calls him the sensei. So me and Salam, we meet each other at, young, at a young age. Salam is doing all the hits. He's barely 20. Wow. Looking like a baby. And he heard about me. And he was like, look, this is the problem. Y'all just too talented. Like, we, what do we, what's the target? This is so important when you enter in a market. Mm. You have to have a strategic point that you want to hit and be able to grow. That's what any form of business is, just logic. And Salam's like, y'all hip hoppers, y'all rappers. This dude's from the hut. You from the suburbs, you from... This shit gotta be some knucklehead shit. First, we got, un until we, until the knuckleheads understand that y'all knuckleheads, we can't go past this point. So by the time it was time to do the score now, it was just like we knew where we had to be. Mm. And we knew that, so Fuji's is short for refugees. And we just knew that whatever we did, we made this oath, it gotta be bigger than the music. It has to be a movement. So in that basement, we knew that we would create a movement. So that's why we call it the score. So we said we was coming to settle the score because you missed out on the first album. You missed mm. on what we was trying to say. So we'll be back to settle the score. And then because of, of the touring, the traveling, the experiences, everything that we went through, we just put all of this stuff, the passion, you know, the the... That at times I'm happy, at times I'm sad, you know, all of this, we just put all of that inside of one album. That's how the score came about. Wow, it's an incredible album. Did you ever, like, what's your advice to kids who think, oh, I don't have access to the right things, I could never make that happen? Like, what's your advice to them? Well, well, if, if there's a kid that's saying <clears throat> that they don't have access to the right things, then that kid will never make it. Why do you say that? Do not have that mentality. Do not say you don't have access to the right things because that's an automatic excuse, right? Say that I do not have access to the right things. But after I heard this interview, if this guy can go into Sam Ash with absolutely no equipment and use the manual, I will never repeat those words again. Mm. I am going to figure it out. That's what I want them to say because that is that mentality. Dude, where we come from, you don't have, we have no time for no losers mentality. No time for no moping because 
it's like if we came from nothing and we turned it into something, we do not expect nothing less from y'all. So we are going to give you the words. We're going to inspire you. And because remember, right, when the legions are going to their death that night, the commander speaks and he says, tonight we all going to dine in hell. Right. If there's one legion out of the pack, that's like, <laughs> I ain't ready to die tonight. You know, like you ain't going to be in that pack. So I need you to understand that. You have to make that decision and say, I'm going to do this. Mm. Like, not I'm thinking about doing this. That's why I say you have to love it. Do you love it as much as you would die for it? Because once you do that, then that anything that you're thinking about, whether if it's writing a book, whether if it's creating an invention, whether if it's flying through the air like LeBron, anything, if you love it, you're going to be that. How do you get that attitude? You get that attitude, right? There's a, a, a philosopher by the name of Confucius. Mm -hmm. Confucius is deep because the, the idea of you don't know what it's like to walk unless you, you fail. Like basically, because I have fallen so many times mm. that I appreciate walking, right? Because if you fall down and every time you fall down, you get back up and you keep moving. You fall down, you get back up, you keep moving. This is how we go from crawling to walking. We didn't just come out of our mama and woman. We was like, boop, 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 boop. I am walking, I am walking, unless we aliens. So basically, <laughs> we come out and we crawling. And from crawling, we walk. Mama's like, goo, goo, gaga, da, 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 da. bang, you fall, right? Then you get back up. You fall, you get back up. This is life. This should be a lesson in life. So if we don't come out of our mama's womb running, why should we think things are going to be easy? They're not going to be easy. We're going to crawl. We're going to walk. We're going to fall. We're going we're gonna to fall. But man, once we figured out the balance with the right feet and the left feet, nothing can stop us. That's what I want them to understand. My oh, man. Yeah, man. How have you had the kind of longevity that you've had? How do you stay fresh? I stay fresh because it's all in the pulse of the youth. You have to be a culture bunny, right? So if you are a sponge, so if you are a sponge for what you love, mm. you don't have to be constantly in the limelight, right? So even if I take seven years off in the commercial space, it don't mean I don't got Kendrick Lamar's first mixtape, you know? It don't mean I'm not tuned into battle rap. It doesn't mean that um, I don't know what trap is. It doesn't mean that I'm not in tune to the dances that's going on. If there's a new book or an old book, if I hear somebody talking about, man, there's something called the, the Alchemist, you should read it. Because once you stay in tune with what you love, that means that you stay in tune with it. When you, you, you're inside of the culture, you do not lose the pulse because you basically have the passion for it. Mm -hmm. The worst thing is you're not on the billboard. Your music ain't playing on the radio. You're sitting around in a bar. You're telling people, you know, I used to be that guy. You know what I'm saying? I, fuck these man. I, I don't even understand half of the shit they saying, man. Nah, I mean, it's like, listen, you fucking has-been. <laughs> you have to be in the culture to be part of the culture. It all boils down to passion. Passion and understanding the because Quincy Jones taught me this, my de, de facto godfather. If once you lose the pulse of the youth, you've lost the pulse of yourself. Whether if it's your greatest philosopher or your greatest quote, my daughter, she's 11, she knows about Einstein. And Einstein done been dead long time ago. What is it that makes her want to read this? Because mm. once again, Everything, whether if you're looking at Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, man, it could even be a quote from, from, from Kennedy. It, it be, what we remember is the simple stuff. It's that one line 
that takes us from here to there. And that one line, that's the pulse of the child. And we can't never forget that. No, that's really powerful. So one last question. What's the impact that you want to have on the world? Well, I mean, the impact I want to have on the world is just let the tombstone read, you know, that I was one that was responsible for helping bring people closer. Because at the end, we're so far apart, and I felt what we continue to do, which is great, is through the music, through the sports, through the technology, it doesn't matter if you're in India, if you're in Africa, if you're in Brooklyn. It's like, as much as they want to divide us now, the millennials keep getting closer and closer and closer. And um, just for me, world peace, world love, the idea of all of us living in harmony is um, perhaps the most important thing. And every human being has to remember, right? So within your existence, if you are not looking out for the next person, then all you are is just a body, right? So if you're not looking out for your next person, you're just a body. Because before we even was in existence, there were those that sacrificed they self so that we can be here talking. Mm -hmm. So I just want people to know that as this world move and it seems so divided, the millennials are actually getting closer and closer through the world. The, the, the women are getting closer. There's a, a movement that's going on and we all should embrace that and just keep getting closer and closer. Yeah. I love it, man. Love Where can it. these guys find you online? Oh, y'all can find me online on uh, wyclef.com. This is an exciting time. So we have the EP, it's called Juve. Mm. So Juve is a, an appetizer to what will be the full length Carnival album. So the best way to explain Juve, if you can't make it to the Caribbean, you know what I mean? Like you're like, man, I don't think I'm gonna make it to the Caribbean. No problem. Just get that Juve, throw it on, grab yourself a Guinness, catch a vibe, <laughs> wear the Mickey Mouse shorts, with no shoes on. You know and a broomstick? I mean? And a broomstick, you already know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let me get him a free concert. Oh my God, please. Right. Um, here we go. So you just pick a topic, man. Pick a, anything in your head. A topic? Yeah, I'm like David Blaine. Wow, if you're really gonna let, here's the one thing I'm, I'm very sad we didn't talk about in the interview, which was you going to Haiti after the earthquake. All right, let's start. Going to Haiti after the earthquake. Man, a lot of courage, man, it took me. Trust me, I'm that true MC after the earthquake. I landed in Haiti. My life started out in a small village. I ate dirt from the floor, homie, no kidding. I ain't had no kitchen. Grandma said, pray to Christ. This Jesus baby barely had a bag of rice. My life started out, I was barely two. Papa flew to the States searching for the golden goose. No work papers, officers raid the underground. They came to get a man, he took off like a greyhound. His life, he got hunted like a groundhog. Sting operation in the legal alien in New York. Like the king, my daddy had a dream. 10 years later, I was sitting up in Brooklyn. Whoa. Fast forward, the earthquake hit the H, picking up the dead, no mass up on my face. On Oprah, when you see me weep, that's cause I seen a little baby brain on the concrete. Seen little boy blue lose his legs, no hospital around, I watched him bleed to death. You would cry too if you had scar face eyes. Never seen a man cry till I seen a man die. Me and Dave Chappelle, I said I wanted to be president. It ain't no joke, man, I wanted to be president of Haiti. I wanted better policy. Started yelling Haiti, they tried to J. Edgar Hoover me. Those with a third eye can see the truth through the lies. You know how it go? You're baptized, crucified, then you rise. This is my resurrection. Freestyle, why cleft it like Tupac. They tried to get me at the intersection. 
Satisfaction like the Rolling Stone. Yeah, I'm in the zone, I'm in my home. I've been freestyling ever since 13. When Rockin' was the microphone fiend, yeah. Why Clef, I flipped the language. Y'all heard this before, but let me flip it in Spanish. Mira, amiga, buenos dias, señorita. Como esta usted y su familia? Estoy en doy bien en el micrófono. Espero que todos están bien como yo. Americans say, how you doing? German people say, wie geht's? When I go to Germany, they say, wie steht's? <laughs> if you love hip hop, let's have some spaß. Tell me, baby girl, wie werden das? Listen. My little biggie shooters, they little like Kim. Man, I ain't no joke, but I rock Kim. I used to slap box in front of the Project Elevator. The way I rock a fella, you gon' think I'm Sean Carter. Yeah, the people, they like, Cleffy going in. Who writing my shit? Ghostwriters from within. Yup, told me y'all should be reminded I'm a motherfucking Fuji and my skull has not been broken. Listen, you dudes are local on the block. Rewind, I mean, I used to be local on the block. Now, in my views, I'm world star hip hop. Rewind. I used to be local on the block. Now my views, world star hip hop. Q rest in peace. Why Clef Jean? I'm in a place well known, getting busy on the microphone. Girls on the side and they all nodding their head. Some love the ball head and some miss the dreads. It don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that was fucking incredible. <laughs> Wow. Wow. That, that was amazing, man. Love, man. Respect. I cannot thank you enough thank for you, sharing man. with us. That was incredible. Thank you. Um, I've got to give you a proper outro here. I've got to tell these people what I hope they just saw is the same thing that I just saw. Boys and girls, this is the quintessential immigrant story of somebody who picked himself up by the bootstraps when he didn't even have any boots, who saw a drum that his grandmother wouldn't let him play that had a fucking snake in it, they took it away. God, if I could keep rhyming, I would. But they really did take the drum from him. He sneaks out in the middle of the night, goes, grabs that thing. That began his obsession with music, an obsession that would take him to the absolute heights of the universe. But in the middle of all of that, he has a quote where he's talking about the day that I show up and say I've already written 50 songs, that I already know how to play the piano, I already know how to play the guitar. On that day, if I ever say that, know that I'm finished. And that is something that you will never hear him say. But hearing the tale in his autobiography about his time in Haiti, about picking up so many bodies, that his hands started to burn from all the toxins that were coming off because they were decomposing, but he kept going how he lost friends that he knew and loved, how people in the middle of the chaos were getting shot, and through all of that, he comes out the other side wanting to be the president of Haiti. How many of us have the balls to say that? Is it a surprise that this man with that mindset wrote one of the greatest albums of all time from a basement? Certainly not surprising to me. You guys can do anything you set your mind to. He is the American dream. He's proven. All you need to do is go read the manual and then put your ass to work. Boys and girls, please help me one more time in thanking this man, Wyclef Jean, for showing up. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Impact Theory. If this content is adding value to your life, our one ask is that you go to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Not only does that help us build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about, but it also helps us get even more amazing guests on here to share their knowledge with all of us. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this community. And until next time, be legendary, my friend.